Okay. All right. So, um, you know, um, because of when uh, presenting the, um, you know, there's only a few people I can see. So definitely uh, feel free to interject uh, or throw in some uh, chat questions if you have any. Uh, but um, yeah, so our, um, our source program um, really, um, it's been in existence now. This, this June will be three years. So, um, you know, we actually weren't, uh, unfortunately weren't in existence all that long before COVID hit. Um, but um, yeah, so it's, it's going on about, you know, it's roughly two and a half, almost three years. Um, the source is in, in a real general sense, um, it's a 24 hour a day, seven day a week, every single day crisis line for all youth up until the age of 26, as well as their caregivers. So, um, and that's a, a, an important thing that I really, um, we like to emphasize is it doesn't have to be just the youth who is um, needing support. The caregiver, if they're experiencing some challenges with their qualified eligible youth, they can also call and get support. Um, we, um, we provide um, um, supportive services um, on the phone, as well as providing in-person urgent response. Um, we originally started out um, only serving current and former foster youth, but that has expanded. Um, but we definitely still do prioritize current and former foster youth um, in our services. Um, I'm not going to um, bore you with all the, the gory details of, uh, of, of it, but um, the, the creation of the source program really came out of a community planning process where, I mean, unfortunately, you know, um, the outcomes for current and former foster youth are great. And, you know, when you take a look at what a, a current and former foster youth has experienced in their past, um, you know, lots of placement disruptions, uh, law enforcement involvement, psychiatric hospitalizations, just all of, you know, homelessness, poor um, educational outcomes, so just lo lots of negative outcomes. And so there was really a recognition that, um, you know, traditional mental health services, while they're, they're good and they, they definitely um, serve a purpose and, and provide great support, um, that we need some non-traditional things to really reach out to, to youth and especially uh, current and former foster youth. And so it was really out of this identification of a greater need um, that was um, identified in the state about um, needing um, a 24 seven crisis line. Um, and that's really, um, you know, from, from that um, stakeholder community planning process really identified kind of the core elements of our program about, um, about they're really having 24 seven availability um, that um, a youth or a caregiver can reach out and they can call us anytime. Um, for those that like to text that they would be able to text us or those that would like to do a, a video chat that they could do that. Um, that um, there would also um, really importantly to have peer staff as part of this service delivery model that we have individuals of lived experience, um, that there would be some capacity of, of being able to do some supportive services beyond just that phone call to, to be able to do some normative activities with the youth. And, and really all of those things have been embedded in how we've uh, launched and um, continued the program. Um, so um, just jump ahead. So, um, you know, um, well, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, we really know about, um, especially specifically, you know, foster youth is when, when a foster youth is, and, and youth in general, when, when they're experiencing um, a challenge or, or a crisis or something, and it escalates and, um, and it, and it kind of comes across in a, you know, conduct behavioral manner, that really places that youth at risk of not being able to remain in that living environment. Um, you know, if they're in a, a biological family or, or living with friends or with relatives or even a foster placement, um, 
you know, they're at risk of being told you can't stay here anymore because of, of that. Um, and unfortunately, you know, lots of lots of youth have experienced trauma in their backgrounds and have trauma reactions to to things that they experience. And, and it can sometimes come out in behavioral manners. Um, and so really, um, one of the things that we're trying to do is to really take a look at uh, prevention services. So even though you can call us for a crisis in the moment, um, I always like to say, you know, don't wait for it to get to that crisis. Even though we're a 24-7 crisis response um, uh, phone line, um, you don't have to wait for it to meet that, you know, definition of, of an urgent crisis. Um, you know, unfortunately, when we when we take a look at situations that escalate into, you know, let's say law enforcement being called or a youth being, you know, put on a 5150 to be hospitalized, you know, oftentimes when you trace it back, you can see like earlier in that day, stuff was going on with that youth, um, you know, either some internal conflicts or some, inter you know, uh, external, you know, uh, argument or a misunderstanding or, or some conflict. And, um, and then it escalates over time where, you know, the youth may, might get frustrated, a caregiver gets frustrated, and then it, it becomes a much larger issue. And so we really like to reinforce that it's okay to call the source early on in that process so that that youth or that caregiver can get some support and suggestions and interventions to, to prevent it from escalating into something bigger. Um, one of the other hallmarks um, of our program is there's a significant number of, um, of youth that are eligible for county mental health services um, in, the, um, in Sacramento County that are not linked to mental health services. These are youth that could benefit from mental health services, um, are definitely eligible for mental health services, but for whatever reason, they're not linked. And there's lots of reasons why youth are not linked. And so one of the things that we can help do beyond that initial uh, call or that visit um, is, you know, if that youth and caregiver is, is wanting to pursue getting linked to mental health services, we can actually support that process happening, um, you know, in, in terms of making the referrals and, and helping to, um, or supporting them in making the referrals, because sometimes, especially for um, youth that have private insurance, that, you know, each insurance plan has their own kind of process, uh, but that's something that we can help do. Um, so again, um, you can call us 24 hours a day. Um, you can do the live chat, which acts, you know, that, that accesses through our website or uh, those that are inclined uh, can text. Now, what I will say is absolutely positively, any one of these three is absolutely uh, perfect for a youth or a caregiver to contact us. But as much as we can, we want to avoid, especially if it's a complex issue, we will try and have that youth or caregiver transition from a text or live chat over to a phone call, just because it gets really challenging to discuss and all the nuances of a, of a dynamic situation just on text and chat. Now, at the end of the day, if a youth and a caregiver does not want to do that, they only want to, we're going to continue to do it on the platform they want to, but we will try and engage them in a phone conversation um, or even in in-person if possible. Um, so let's talk about who is eligible. Any youth under the age of 26 in Sacramento County. So they've got to reside in Sacramento County. And I will say reside is a loose definition. We aren't asking anybody, you know, it, you know anybody who calls isn't, you know, we're not uh, verifying exactly where they live. Um, if they're homeless and usually are in another county, but right now they're in Sacramento County, they fully qualify. Um, as well as the caregivers of an eligible youth. So, you know, for example, if you have a, you know, a caregiver that's maybe struggling dealing with um, the mental health um, challenges of the a youth under their care, they can call us and get some support and guidance. 
Um, the definition of caregiver is also very loose. Um, it isn't just a biological or a legal relationship. It's whoever is in a role of basically being the, you know, caring for that youth. We don't really care, um, you know, how specific it is. Uh, Chris, just so, to jump, Chris, just to jump in on that. Yeah. So a youth development worker who's running a youth program, can they, are, would they fall under that broad definition of a caregiver? Let's say there's a young person in the program and they're needing some, some advice. Sure. I think that would be fine. And, um, and, you know, one of the things, um, you know, we've also had cases where we'll have like a, um, a teacher at a school has called and, hey, I've got the youth here and, you know, they need some support. Now, what, you know, what we might want to do is try and pivot that communication from that worker to the youth themselves. And, um, you know, so we can further engage them. But yeah, anybody can call us and, um, and get some support and assistance on, on how to do that. Um, the one kind of caveat I, I will say is like if somebody was to, you know, let's say a, um, a youth worker was to call and say, hey, this family needs an in-person, will you go out there? We're going to definitely want to engage um, and have that youth or caregiver contacting us because voice and choice is really important. And we don't want to have it be like, um, you know, we don't want to be seen as like a uh, CPS or some punitive thing about like, oh, they sent out this team to come to my house and, and meet with us. So um, that's, that's all I would say about that. We want it to be very, um, uh, collaborative. Um, so, uh, a lot of the objectives of the program are around, you know, um, maintaining placement, you know, and that can be a formal placement or informal. Um, we want to help empower, um, positive problem solving and crisis intervention. If a situation is at a, you know, a very elevated, um, you know, high risk, lots of tempers going, we want to help de-escalate that situation. Uh, we, we definitely are also targeting when possible to reduce the chance of law enforcement, act, act, you know, involvement in that case, or for that youth ending up in uh, psychiatric hospitalization. Now, sometimes a psychiatric hospitalization is actually the most appropriate intervention. But um, as I mentioned, there's oftentimes situations that if you could come in and provide some preventative support and intervention early on, you can help reduce the chance of that happening. Um, and so some of, some of those, some of those are, are, are the big goals that we have. Um, you know, the crises that, that a, a youth can be, or a caregiver can be experiencing can be, you know, anything from what, you know, we would all probably think of a crisis, you know, like uh, um, um, somebody harming themselves, harming others, you know, property destruction, um, you know, refusing to follow a, a caregiver, a parent's instructions. Um, if they're in kind of a formal, like a foster placement, if the, you know, um, if the uh, resource family is looking at giving notice because of these behaviors, um, you know, we want to try and avoid those types of situations. Um, you know, of course, violence, aggressiveness behavior, but it also can be lesser things. You know, it can be, um, as an example, like, gosh, you know, my, I'm really challenged that, you know, the youth seems pretty depressed and is just not, you know, they're not getting up and eating or sleeping way too much, or they're, you know, they're not bathing, brushing their teeth. Those are things that somebody could call us and get some support and, and guidance around. Um, so a lot of the, uh, different types of, um, of the interventions we do is, you know, definitely kind of immediate crisis de-escalation, coaching, um, very short-term uh, coping skills when necessary, creating safety plans, um, sometimes doing a very short respite break can be um, very positive. So for example, like, you know, let's say there's a, a lot of conflict or argument happening you know, sometimes just separating people and give giving people a chance to kind of cool down and um, and have some staff talk to each person um, separate um, can be really beneficial. Uh, referrals and resources, connecting um, when you identify a need to something um, outside of what we're providing, uh, we definitely provide that. 
Um, also, peer support is also really important, um, either by our youth peer mentors or our family partners. Uh, so again, some of this, um, we, you know, lots of uh, referrals and advocacy. Um, now, we are a short term program um, in that, you know, they, they, you know, we can get, a, we can provide a service like a one time, it could be just be a couple of minutes on a phone or on a text. Or it can also be as much as up to a maximum of 60 days. And so and, and in those cases, it's, you know, it's really about identifying that Hey, this this youth has a need that is going to um, require some more, um, you know, some more in depth of work and coordination than just doing, a, you know, a, a connection of one or two times. And we can go and provide um, those services, especially when you're looking at um, coordinating and linking linking services for that youth or that family, because you know, as we know, it, it can take a while. So even if you're trying to make a referral to mental health services that are gonna be like long-standing mental health services, you know, it takes a while for that process to actually happen and for that intake appointment and such. And so we can be um, a continued support for those cases. Uh, so uh, kind of giving um, a little bit of a, a description of the array of our staff. Um, so we have um, urgent response coordinators, and these tend to be kind of more like bachelor level mental health staff. Uh, we do have clinicians, therapists, um, as well as our, um, our youth um, peer mentors and our family partners who are, um, have the lived experience. And any combination of those staff um, at any time can be providing support. So, um, you know, and especially, um, well, whether it's, you know, somebody contacting us on the platforms or in person, we'll match whatever is um, the, what the caller wants and as well as what may be identified as a need um, to whatever that individual um, has. And, and so we have a, a nice, um, you know, array of different roles that we can um, have them work with. Um, so again, there's a lot of different ways that you can connect with us. So, um, you know, our number is 916 support. It's uh, hopefully easy to remember. Um, and so individuals can uh, call us, they can text us. Uh, they, uh, you know, the, um, the secure chat is actually through our website, which is um, the source sacramento.com. Um, and we're there, you know, 24 seven all the time. Okay, and we also do have social media presence um, on, um, you know, uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, that um, we, um, you know, we, we post a lot of things, um, community resource fund things, informational um, things for the, um, for the youth and for the various caregivers. Okay. Um, and if you have any questions, um, you know, here and, you know, and I can send this out um, to you, Jim, if you want to distribute it for everybody, but um, uh, Jason Isaacson is our clinical program manager and then uh, Rhapsody Flores is actually our uh, county mental health coordinator. Um, or, you know, if you ever have any questions, you can also just call the hotline. We get a lot of people that will call 916 support and just get some more information about what services and, and that's absolutely uh, an appropriate thing to do. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Chris. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Um, okay. I think what we're going to do now is just move on to uh, the presentation from the Youth Health Network. And we're going to be joined here by Amanda and by Tess. I'll let them introduce themselves and tell you more about the Youth Health Network. And then at the very end, we'll, we will have a little time for questions and answers, I believe. But in the meantime, if you do have questions, please feel free to use the chat. Hello, folks. Give me one second to get this presentation up fully. All righty. So my name is Amanda. I am the outreach specialist for the YHN team here at Capital Star Community Services. And I am Tess. I am one of the youth advocates um, with YHN. Yeah, and so we are considered a, an outreach program for mental health, which means that we do not provide any direct care or treatment services to youth. 
We do, however, support youth who are between the ages of 16 to 25 years old who live in Sacramento County by getting them connected to any resources in the community that might be helpful for them and their well being. So our program was designed to be very low barriers. We work with a lot of young folks who are experiencing homelessness, um, maybe they're experiencing sexual trafficking or exploitation, um, severe mental illness, incarceration, um, all of these system impacted issues that can have a huge um, effect on their mental health. So sometimes folks don't wanna share a whole lot of information with us on the warm line. And in that situation, we're okay with taking very minimal intake information. So that way we can just get them in and get started with supporting them. So the only requirements really are just the age range and living anywhere in Sacramento County. Something unique about our team is that we are an advocate led team. So mostly we are made up of youth advocates. So those are folks who have personal lived experience with mental illness or systems of care that our youth might have had experience with as well. And we're big on peer support as well as case management. Our program goes for up to 90 days long. And during that time, we get folks connected with any of their basic needs that they might have. We're here to advocate for our clients and also teach them how to advocate for themselves. Since we will not always be here, there will not always be a caretaker or a support person available. And we wanna make sure that they have those skills to be independent and be successful. And then um, one of the big reasons that our program was created was because the county did a needs assessment for young folks and determined that one of the big problems is that young people don't know what resources exist. And even if they do know of them, they struggle with navigating the systems that exist. And so that's where we come in. We're the ones who have navigated it on our own and with clients. And so we can kind of take them under our wing and start supporting them. Okay, our program is partially funded by Sacramento County Behavioral Health and then also through MHSA funding. And we are community based, which is amazing because we're able to go out there and meet youth wherever they are in the community. Um, we meet people at their homes if that's what they want. We can do phone or we can do um, virtual sessions with them. And then my favorite part is that YHN staff, we have co-locations throughout the county. So we are stationed at certain spots that our transition age youth frequent. So some of those places will be WIND Youth Services for the drop-in center and also their shelter programs. We are there supporting. So if any conflict or crisis emerges, we'll be able to get in there, offer some peer support, de-escalate um, de and stabilize, and then get them connected with anything that would be helpful in that moment. And we are always looking for other places to partner. So if you feel like you have a need for having some youth advocates and maybe a clinician there every once in a while to support some of the youth at your staff, that would be a conversation that I'd be happy to direct to Sydney um, Caldwell, our manager of the program. Take it away, Des. Okay. Um... So like Amanda was saying, our goal is to be as low barrier as possible uh, because we know that the system navigation can be really scary to begin with. And so our goal is to make um, our services as accessible as possible. Um, and so what that looks like specifically for uh, mental health, like assessments and referrals, um, we generally, uh, support folks that have any insurance or no insurance. Um, we also can support in um, getting folks insurance, getting them set up with Medi-Cal, and then moving on in the process of getting them mental health assessments and referrals, things like that. We take place of Sacramento Access. So for folks that maybe don't know what that is, um, Access is a line that you can call and um, they will ask you questions about your mental health and kind of where what do you want to do with it and then from there they will send a referral to a system of care like an FSP program or a FIT program which are different kinds of mental health programs for um, younger youth and transitional age youth. Uh, 
what we find, like Amanda was saying, is that sometimes you either fall off or get stuck in the cracks somewhere with things like that because they're afraid of answering the phone or they don't really understand what's going on. And so kind of a lot of times what happens once they're done talking to Access is there's no follow through for various reasons. Um, so our goal is kind of to bridge that gap in services and do it in more a personal way. So each youth will get an advocate and we do our best to try to fit the youth with an advocate that is either has been through similar systems as them or has maybe had similar types of experiences with them. So they kind of have that um, like, okay, this person can hear me, this person can see me, maybe they don't understand exactly what I'm going through, but in some extent they do, which can be kind of comforting and make the whole process less scary. Um, we do also support, we have mental health crisis support. We are not 24 hours though. So our warm line runs from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, week. So during the weekday, Monday to Friday. And um, within those working hours are typically when our advocates work. And if you call the warm line and within those hours are you have someone that's in crisis, um, we can come out. So we have workers of the day that will um, come out to wherever the youth is, if that's something that they're comfortable with, if they prefer just a phone call, then we will follow up with a phone call, we'll follow up with a text message. It's really um, just us being focused on meeting them where they're at to try to get them as comfortable as possible. And then um, kind of moving on within the process of where are they at, what are they comfortable with, what can we help with, and kind of moving off of that. Um, we do also support with relinking to mental health providers. So it's common for folks to be referred to places and then lose contact with them for whatever reason, or maybe they don't really feel like they fit with their therapist, but they don't know how to do that. Um, we support with getting in contact with whoever they're currently linked to, and we can also support them with having the conversation of, I'm not really fitting with this therapist, what are the next steps, um, things like that. And uh, we do also do linkages to AOD services if that's something that the youth is interested in. Um, we can always do that. And say also they come to us, we're a 90 day program. So they come to us and maybe they're not really ready to do the mental health um, assessment right at the beginning or they're not really ready for the AOD services. The cool thing about us is that they can open with us as many times as they need up to their 26th birthday. So if they're not ready the first time around, we can focus purely on peer support, getting to know the youth, getting to know their reservations as to why they um, are maybe not ready, things like that. And then um, say the first 90 days go by, we can close them, reopen them, and then start the process from there. Um, so really low barrier and just trying to work with them and where they're at to try and make that bridge as accessible as possible. Sorry about that. Okay. So knowing when to reach out, signs that a youth might need some extra support. Some of these might seem obvious, but I think they're important to go through. Um, so loss of interest, when a youth seems like they've lost interest in things that you know that they generally enjoy, that are, you know, high interest things for them, that might be a sign that something's going on there. Um, and I like something that Francisco said in our breakout group earlier, which was to stay curious. I totally agree. I think the best way of figuring out if a youth needs something is for us as providers to stay very curious and observe what's going on. Be mindful of patterns. Be mindful of what's going on with your, your young person. Um, so do they have a change in their affect? Are they coming in? And usually they make, they make eye contact, but today they're just not, they're not here in the same space with you. Are they hunched over? Um, do they usually smile more? Are they kind of frowning? Do they visibly look like something's going on? Um, are you starting to notice that they're missing your appointments or they're not going to school or work and doing the things that um, they typically would do to take care of themselves? Same with change in habits. Maybe they're, they're not eating. Maybe you're noticing that they're you know, rapidly changing in weight or um, they're walking around, they're tired all the time. Change in a housing situation. That's something that impacts our youth 
heavily. Um, not having a place to stay or not having a safe place to be can definitely impact mental health. And then I would say just mood swings in general. Of course, our young people, you know, mood swings happen for all of us, but um, it's when you, you get that kind of gut reaction, that intuition where you go, hmm, something feels off. It's always a good thing to follow that curiosity and follow that intuition if you have it because you've been trained in how to work with young people and you kind of know when things are changing. Um, so yeah, stay curious, ask questions, be very consistent because a lot of times our young folks don't have a consistent support person in their life. And so we all get to be that person for them. Um, and for me, I think I always start off by um, kind of saying, hey, it sounds like you might need some peer support. Would you be willing to just talk to someone, someone that you can talk to, play games with, maybe you can meet up in person every once in a while and just, you know, talk about what's going on in your life. And usually that can be a good starting point, even if you don't feel like they're ready to start therapy or mental health services, they can at least have someone to talk to them and kind of build up their readiness for getting services. Okay, and so how to start the conversation? Um, it can be kind of scary to try and start that conversation because you don't want them to take it the wrong way. Uh, so some things that we try to go off of, um, in a, if you're in a group setting and you kind of notice that the person is off, just maybe discreetly ask to check in with them separately. Um, and from there, kind of establish it as a safe space. A lot of times our youth have had a lot of experiences before where maybe they're feeling attacked or they're feeling like you're coming for them, um, things like that. And so just establishing that you're a safe person, that this is a safe space to talk about things because perhaps they have never had that opportunity. So they don't really know what that looks like. Um, and kind of what I was saying before, really important for us to meet them where they're at. Um, Mari in our group that our breakup group was actually saying youth voice, youth choice. And that's what our motto is at Capital Star um, is what they feel comfortable with is what goes for them because we can't force anybody to get services that they don't want and that they're not ready for. And at the end of the day, if we do try to um, force them into something that they're not ready for, it can end up in them not having the best experience and then kind of going backwards. So we definitely try to just meet them where they're at, be kind um, to them and just know that maybe you don't know the whole story, you don't know what's happening, but um, showing up for them and being kind and showing your consistency is a big thing. Um, if it seems like they're open to a conversation about mental health, then kind of maybe just breaking that barrier a little bit and saying, hey, um, have you ever talked about mental health services before? Do you know what that looks like? Kind of just gauging their responses and um, their experiences. And then from there, uh, I would say always, always validate their feelings. Um, and offer supportive resources. I would say if you feel that you have the capacity to um, offer to call with them. So our warm line, you can text, call, you can reach out to us on Instagram um, via DM. We're very accessible. And so maybe they're scared to make that call or scared to make that text, just offer to sit with them and support them through that or just provide them with the resources. Um, we do have little contact cards as well as brochures. We are on Instagram as well. So kind of just opening that door for them and then giving them the opportunity to say, hey, yes, I would like your support with this or I think I can do it on my own and just going from there. Yeah, so again, here's a slide. It talks a little bit more about those access points. Feel free to take a screenshot of this right now if that's something that you'd like. However, we will be sending this, this um, deck out along with some of our flyers and brochures. So we are open nine to seven, just Monday through Friday for now. That's our warm line number and the text line. Um, it's, it's technically the same number, the 916-860-9819. Um, the 833 is just our vanity line. So I always just give out the 916 number because you can either text or call it. 
And then, um, so my role as the outreach specialist, I'm the one who creates all of our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter content. Um, and then I post it all to engage community members and our youth. So highly recommend that you follow us on there if you do not already and stay up to date on all of our program offerings. We do run some groups for our youth right now we're working on, we're doing three gender-based groups. Um, so one for women identifying folks, another for male identifying folks, and then um, one that's called basically for gender fluid folks, folks who do not identify on the gender binary. Um, and those are really popular with our youth right now. So if you have any youth who are questioning their identity or their self-expression or they're not being supported in that way, those would be good groups for them to join and just have peer support and be around people who have similar concerns. Um, and then our website, starsyouth.net, we have hundreds of resources listed on there, as well as more information about our program. This is just a little chart that talks about our, our Capital Star families services a little bit. So um, like I said before, we are an outreach based program. So we do not offer treatment, but we regularly, when we do our assessments, we refer folks out to our treatment programs that are in-house. So we have our full service partnership, FSB, which is for intensive needs um, for 16 to 25 year olds. And then the children's mental health fit program, um, since we work with 16 to 25 year olds, we would typically, um, there are times where we've referred folks who are in the 16 to 21 year old age range to the FIT program. So we kind of have those two options within house. We also have our crisis residential program. So if folks need some stabilization and they need to just go somewhere where they are wrapped in support, they can go there. We help refer there. Um, if someone um, is deemed or they report being, you know, involved in sex trafficking or exploitation, we can refer them for more um, specialized support from our CSET outreach team. They have therapists on staff who have experience supporting in that way. And then we also have our newest program, which is our uh, recovery services program. It's an AOD program for young folks who have chemical dependency. Um, and what's great is that they can receive case management from YHN and the recovery services program at the same time if they wanted. So they could go over to the AOD program and receive some substance use therapy, some case management around that specific challenge. And then they could come over to us and if they needed to get SSI or help finding a job or help getting benefits, a DMV waiver, all of those things, then that's, um, that's stuff that we can all help with while they're getting that concurrent support. I know we're running uh, low on time, so I'll go over this quickly. You can screenshot if you'd like. Um, these are all the other services that we can support folks with. So we're not just mental, mental health services. Um, we can support with pretty much anything a youth needs. We will support in finding them resources or if we can um, follow through with it ourselves. So we have DMV fee waivers. So if you have folks that need an ID but don't have money for the ID, we can support in taking them to the DMV um, and getting their ID with one of the fee waivers that we have. Um, yeah, we support with getting into school, benefits, things like that. Um, okay, cool. Good on time. So um, we support with pretty much anything that a youth would need. I've supported youth with... Um, getting back into school for their GED. They have the Sacramento Library has a free GED program. So we refer to that often. That's a really great resource. Um, sometimes folks just need peer support. So we do that. And like Amanda said, we run different groups um, throughout the month and kind of just have folks go to that if that's something that they're interested in and kind of support them in building a sense of community. Um, navigating through EDD. I believe we support with that, right, Amanda? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Really any yep. resource that folks need, yep. we're able to support with. Yeah, I've supported folks with um, getting set up with SSI benefits. Um, we support folks getting set up with housing. That's a really big one for us is so anybody that's experiencing any type of um, housing instability, we have supportive services. So we 
refer to supportive services, um, shelters, more long-term transitional housing, uh, vouchers, we can support them with just even looking for apartments and uh, just through the process of how you get that started, um, budgeting for an apartment, employment. With employment, we can either support them in just simple things like getting their resume started, looking on Indeed, or we can refer them to more supportive programs that support with employment. It really is um, just like a case-by-case -case basis on whatever the, need, the youth needs and what they're ready for support for. So yeah. Oh, and we also support with uh, a big one I'll mention is our primary care physician. So I know it can be scary or like confusing to get a doctor and we do support youth with getting set up with a doctor and um, supporting them in like getting to the doctors. Yeah. And then here we go again. This is just an example of one of our flyers and then something we have posted on Instagram to get folks aware that we exist. There's the number again, our website again, and then our social media platforms are all at Youth Help Network. It's just our name. And that is all folks. Here is our contact information if you have any questions. You are more than welcome to reach out to us. We can get you in contact with our supervisor, Sydney, if needed. And we would love to answer any more questions if you have them. Great, thanks Tess and Amanda, really appreciate it. I was wondering if you might just share a little bit more about um, the, ups, the uh, positive uh, role that peer support plays, like Tess in your case, young people reaching out to you, um, how do, what's your experience with that? And um, I know that uh, Amanda had mentioned earlier in our breakout group that often young people are intimidated by the idea of like going to see a therapist or, or there may be stigma around it in their family or in their culture. There certainly was when I was growing up. So maybe you could share a little bit about that, Tess. Yeah, so I think peer support is super important um, for most of the reasons that you said. Um, a lot of the folks that we serve either don't have much of a support system or they come from a family that um, was taught that mental health isn't really a thing um, or they just don't believe in mental health. Um, or also we get a lot of folks that have been mistreated by the systems um, previously. And so then that creates a lot of distrust because they tried to put themselves out there before, maybe get therapy, um, tried to get housing before, and then just something happened within that, that it didn't go well. And so then they're very distrusting of the system for very valid reasons. And so uh, peer support is kind of helpful in the sense that it's, I see you, I hear you, I believe you, when maybe they feel like nobody has seen them or believed them before. Um, and I am gonna support you in, figuring out the steps that we should take to get you to your goal, because they usually do have the goal. Or I get a lot of folks that are like, I feel like I need mental health services, but I also feel like it's not going to work because it hasn't worked in the past. And so kind of just saying, I believe you, uh, those feelings are very valid. And maybe let's get to the root of why you feel like that didn't work in the past. And I can get to know you and then from there, try to support you in the services that best fit. Um, and Amanda does a really good job of fitting support people. So youth advocates like me to people on our team, we have a really well-rounded team um, of folks that have had a plethora of experiences in life and um, experiences with navigating different systems. And so Amanda does a really good job of um, saying, I think this person would be the best fit for you. Uh, for an advocate. So I'm going to send you to them. And then if you feel like it's not a good fit, let us know and we'll try to find somebody else. Um, but Amanda does usually get it right. So props to you. But yeah, I think peer support is really, um, really important, especially because I have had a lot of folks that were very distrusting of the systems and that's totally fine. They opened with me four or five times. And then at the end of that, um, they're in services long term and they have housing and things kind of are looking up for them. And so 
I think it's really like a important piece to the puzzle, especially for young folks who are trying to navigate this world, this very scary world. Um, if I could just add something to uh, what Tess said, I think everything she said was really important. Uh, the other, you know, feedback um, we've heard from from um, youth, and this, you know, this is across lots of different programs when they get to work with um, a youth mentor, is you know sometimes where the youth is, you know, physically, emotionally, it, you know, um, they can't even see like things being better just because of where they are. And when they can work with somebody who has kind of been there, done that and come out on the other side and is doing well and, and being able to like give back and to be a mentor and be that role model of wellness and recovery, it could be really powerful uh, for you. So uh, that I think is another thing that can just, just the role by itself can be really powerful. Great. So we do have a little bit of time here. If there's a question or a feedback reaction from someone uh, in our virtual meeting space here, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. I do have a question. Um, do you all have Spanish speaking youth advocates? Um, so just to so um, we are in the process of hiring some our Spanish speaking staff had left previously. And then our supervisor, our program manager is Spanish speaking. So we have that. And then I think Alex, our, our other supervisor, he speaks Mandarin, I think, not 100% on that. Um, but yes, we really value being having bilingual staff. So we're working on that. We have someone new starting on the fourth. So coming up. Thank you. Are there any specific, like, ex like situations that you might need to support with anyone? Any questions of how we could support? Uh, I got a couple uh, comments, I guess, more than questions. Uh, so um, here in at SAR, we we do have a lot of Spanish speaking uh, mentors as well as facilitators uh, capable of uh, having, you know, one-on-ones, uh, bilingual type of uh, communication with youth. And we do work with a lot of Hispanic uh, or bilingual uh, that come through here. One of the things we've noticed is that it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like more people are starting to want to be here, want to participate. Uh, and, and I've been, lately I've been battling with it because it's getting to where, um, it's getting too big. It, we can't sustain it. We can't sustain that, that big of a group, right? And a lot of it has to do with uh, not enough stuff out there in the community, not enough love, not enough comfort zone where people can come and kick back and, you know, have, have a place to just meet other kids and, and be able to, you know, get along and things like that. And, uh, you know, just, I just felt like, I just wanted to share a little bit of that because I think it's important to this audience, especially that, that you know about it. And it's, and like I said, it's, it, I've never been in a situation where I feel like, man, I gotta start to, I'm already like, there's there's new opportunities out there. I'm already thinking about, I'll send these three over there, these five over there and <laughs> like that, right? And I'll get them involved, right? I don't just wanna go, hey, I can't help you kid or, it, you know, we gotta shut the door and then, we're limited space too, limited space. So we got two offices, thank God, two offices, one for them and one for the adult population. But, you know, it's, it's, it's been overwhelming these last, 
I'd say these last couple of months, you know, and like right now, you know, people were asking for a ride. I had to cancel a ride because our one of our vehicles broke down. And and so, but it's it's good, you know, it's a good feeling, it's it's a good thing, but it it it's it's a trip. You know, I told them, hey, get all that information. We can send them over there. We want, we want to refer some people to you guys. You know, whatever we can refer. Uh, and we've been, he's been writing the whole time. Great. So thank you. I just. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate that. Appreciate all the work you do. Yeah. I think, uh, I think you, if folks were following the chat, you may have seen that Amanda did offer to have Youth Help Network come out to pop-ups. So if you would like for the Youth Help Network to join you, I think that's a super fun idea. And thank yes. you for that offer. Yeah. So we're going to wrap up now and turn it back over to Christina. We very much want to thank Chris, Tess, and Amanda for joining us. You are all doing super work. You're our, you're our, our heroes out there doing this great work. So thanks so much. And uh, we'll be uh, reconnecting again in a month. In the meantime, if you have any feedback on the sessions, if you want to suggest topics for future sessions, always feel free to email me. I would love to have that conversation with you as we continue to uh, build out this series.